Hey everybody, it's Pastor Jeff. Back to talk to you about this week's installment from Dr. Moeller's book entitled The Conviction to Lead. In chapter 6, Dr. Moeller opens up the discussion focusing on the passion side of leadership and uh, really draws to the surface the God-given gift that is passion in the spiritual leader. Now, the chapter opens by Dr. Moeller introducing us to the German philosopher Kierkegaard, who made famous the observation, according to his opinion, that the Christians of his day, in particular in, in the environment that he was in, he said they mustn't believe what they claim to believe. And he, he, he really keyed in on the pastors and the spiritual leaders. And he said that there's no way that they can truly believe this Christian doctrine that they proclaim. And the evidence that he used to support such a claim was he said, I see no passion in their lives. He said, if they truly believe the Christian doctrine that they proclaim, there would be passion in their lives that would be undeniable by any that looked in and saw how they lived. What a sad commentary on the Christian community that surrounded Kierkegaard. You know, it's an interesting point that he brings up, and that is, are we living with the fire of our faith? Are we showing the world as Christian leaders that our God reigns, that Christ is in fact alive? For those that have been captured by grace, those that have been drawn out of the pit of damnation, all by the glory and the grace of God, should in fact live with a passion that is undeniable, a passion that is infectious, a passion that in large part defines our very being. This is at the heart of our witness oftentimes. Well, Dr. Moeller does a really great job in this chapter of helping us flesh out so many of the important parts of passion and leadership. You know, for example, one of the things that he makes very clear is that passion should be contrasted against enthusiasm. You know, don't confuse pure passion that comes from the heart, the deep well of passion. Don't confuse that with the temporary flashes of enthusiasm where somebody may show some emotionalism, but emotionalism is temporary. Passion comes from the deep well of the heart that God gives. In the Christian's life in particular, the Christian convictions, the the truths that we take from God's Word, not just the facts, but the very essence of our faith, these deep Christian convictions could and should and will lead to passion in the way that we live, the way that we love, the way that we learn, ultimately in the way that we lead. You know, we, we have to, at the same time, guard against what I would call uh, not Dr. Moeller's words here, but mine, but we have to guard against a lopsided understanding of passion. Let me tell you what I mean. We talk here at the bridge oftentimes about Ephesians 4.15 and understanding that many of the ills of the world, be they personal or in a community or on a global stage, they could and would be addressed if only people would entrust themselves, truly entrust themselves, to God's truth in love, Ephesians 4.15. Well, when I'm talking about be cautious, being cautious of not developing a lopsided passion, uh, what I'm speaking to here is that we have some in the Christian world that can become overly drawn to one or the other side of truth and love. You know, where you have all truth, no love, for example, you've got a pool of Pharisees. On the other hand, get to a place where you become lopsided on love to the exclusion of truth, and you've got a cult. So where passion can and is God-given in the Christian's life, we have to also guard against the perversions of passion that can come out of a lopsidedness. Now, let me just also make clear that when we talk about passion, we're going to use the language of the heart. Now, truth sometimes can sound somewhat analytical. Um, we, we can get caught up sometimes in the cold, stale language of analysis. Passion really is going to speak in the language of the heart. 
And, and it doesn't mean that it's only caught up in the emotion of the heart. But to understand passion, it's to get down into the nitty gritty. It, it's to embrace the call to be a champion of change. And where facts and figures sometimes support the need, the language of the heart will speak to mission and purpose and the ultimate vision that God would have and, and the vision and the purpose that's behind the passion that God is enabling. So I want to encourage you, if you have sensed God's call to be a spiritual leader, to embrace this call for passion. And at the same time, let me guard against the risk of some who might perceive passion as fitting in some kind of a cookie cutter box. I had a conversation just this morning where we focused in on the reality that passion comes in a lot of different shapes and sizes. Perhaps you're one, a, a typical type A personality where you're kind of gregarious and outspoken and, and your passion, uh, it just oozes out of you. But let me also encourage you if perhaps you're one whose passion is aligned with those that it have been said, uh, for example, that still waters run deep. Perhaps your passion is not as obvious but that doesn't mean for a second that it doesn't run as deep. And so I just want to ask you to, to pray. Pray about the passion that God would have you lead with, that others would be drawn to. You see, true biblical God-given passion, it both invites people to the cause of Christ, but it also ignites people to the cause of Christ. And while we can't give or manufacture passion in others, True passion will spread. As God does a work in and through the passionate leader, he will use that leader and the passion in that person to draw others to himself. Now, I want to close by sharing with you a story that was shared with me. Uh, not long after we as a family arrived on Kent Island as church planting missionaries, I attended a conference here in the Washington, D.C. area where Craig Rochelle was a speaker who shared at the close of the conference with probably three or four hundred church planters and other uh, church leaders that were in the building. And this is, in a nutshell, what he shared. Uh, he came forward, and, and to be honest with you at the time, I didn't know him from Adam, but uh, he and his ministry were thriving. Uh, apparently, he was the envy of a lot of ministers and church planters and missionaries, and he came out and he said, listen, I'm sick and tired of getting emails and letters from people like you. It's quite a way to come into a conversation with folks that had paid money to come listen. Uh, but this is what he said. He, I, I'm sick and tired of getting emails and letters from people like you. I know you, you church planters, you missionaries, you pastors. He said, and here's why I'm sick and tired of getting these kind of emails from you. Because predominantly what I'm hearing is, if only I had the kind of money and the provision that your church had, I could do what your church is doing. And he got really got in the grill of all the people that were in the audience. And he said, I'm sick and tired of hearing that. He said, let me, let me give you uh, my reasoning behind this. He said, you people that are talking about, oh, if we only had more provisions, oh, the work we could do for God and all this. He said, let me just ask you to imagine for a minute that one of your children, let's say you've got a little girl, five or six years old, and tomorrow morning you woke up to the horror of finding out that she had been kidnapped. She had been kidnapped by people that claimed and threatened to kill her. They said that they were going to kill her if you didn't come up with a million dollars by Saturday. He said, let's assume that you believed them and you thought that was true. He said, I'm here to tell you that I know, given that you are Christian missionaries, leaders in church, you would probably, at a rate of probably 9 out of 10, maybe 100% of you, not only would you get that million dollars, you'd probably have it by Wednesday, well in advance of the Saturday deadline, because you wouldn't be denied. You can imagine, he had pretty much arrested the attention of the room myself included. And I, I have to tell you, uh, I was blessed because I wasn't one complaining about provision. But I got his point nonetheless, because this is what he then said. He said, 
Now, let me take you back to the emails and your thoughts and your complaints and your worries and your concerns about not having enough provision to do the ministry that you think God has called you to. He said, why do you think it is that you would have the million dollars well in advance of the deadline for which your daughter's life was in the balance? He said, because you love her. You would do whatever it took to get that done if you truly believed that her life was at stake. He said, gentlemen, those of you that write me these kinds of emails, you don't have a provision problem. You have a passion problem. For if you had the passion for your ministry that you have for your daughter, just as you would come up with what was ever needed to get the job done to save her life, so it would be if you had such passion for your ministry to serve your king and do the kingdom service that he has called and created you to do and to be. I never forgot that, and I doubt I ever will. And I, too, became a believer in the call and the power of God-given passion. And so I say to you to close out this morning in this chapter, I pray that you will get in touch with the passion that God has given you, that he has called you to, and that he wants to work in and through your life. Seek out the God of the harvest, the giver of this passion, and then utilize what he has given you as you faithfully obey his call and his commission on your life. Do it all by his grace and all for his glory, I pray. Until next week, I pray that you will passionately lead the charge and fight the good fight that the Lord has given you. Be blessed, and I'll talk to you again next week. Amen and amen.